Hello and welcome to chapter 7 of Intro to Psychology. In this video, I'll be discussing cognitive psychology as well as problem solving strategies. Take a look at this puzzle. This type of puzzle is called Sudoku. And Sudoku has two very simple rules. Rule number one is that every row and every column must have numbers one through four in it. And uh, rule number two is that every box, each one of these smaller boxes here, must, con must also contain numbers one through four. So if you look here at this uh, box on the top left, uh, you'll see that it already contains numbers three and four. So that means that the remaining numbers to go in these two boxes are numbers one and two. Then the question is, uh, does one go here or does one go here? Does two go here or does, or does two go here? Uh, and you can see that by looking at rule number one, uh, that uh, you can't put number one here because it is in the same row as another number one. And you can't put two here because that would be in the same row uh, as another number two. So instead, uh, two must go here and number one must go here. Uh, take a stab at this puzzle and see if you can get the solution. Uh, the solution will be posted uh, a few slides later. Take a look at the second puzzle. This is a spatial reasoning puzzle, and the rule is uh, very simple. It's just this one sentence. Uh, the, the challenge is to connect all nine dots with four connecting straight lines without lifting uh, your cursor from the screen. So the key is four connecting straight lines that go through all nine dots. So for example, you could go like this, that's one straight line, and then like this, that's another straight line, and then like this would be another straight line, uh, and that gives you three straight lines, and there's no way to get a straight line that goes through both of these points. Let's try a different way. Uh, so uh, maybe it starts off diagonally. So you could go like this, and then like this, and then what do you do from there? Uh, if you go through here, then you're gonna be left with uh, several dots that aren't uh, covered. Let's try another one. Um, maybe, maybe something like this would be one straight line. And like this, that would be two, and then three, and then, no, still four. Uh, this was a more difficult problem to solve. Here's the solution. Uh, the solution to this spatial reasoning puzzle uh, is a little bit more complex. It's a, it requires a little bit more creative thinking. If you look carefully at the rule, the rule did not say anything about one crossing lines uh, and also didn't say anything about going outside the lines of the box. Uh, so you'd start here and go from this square and go outside of the box, then go diagonally outside of the box again and go up again and then one last fourth line to get through all of them. Uh, this is an example of kind of a limited thinking strategy uh, to solving a problem. This Sudoku puzzle, uh, trial and, and error works very well. You can kind of just input numbers and uh, see if, you, uh, if, if it all matches up and if all the numbers are able to go correctly in their rows and columns. Uh, whereas this one, trial and error, didn't work so well. You needed a different kind of problem solving strategy in order to get the answers of the puzzle. In order to understand these types of problem solving strategies, uh, there's a need to understand how the brain handles information. So cognitive psychology is the study of cognition. Uh, when, when I say cognition, uh, I broadly mean thinking, or perhaps thinking and emotions are probably the two uh, big categories uh, of cognition. Uh, but it means, also means things like memory, uh, intelligence, language, problem solving, uh, all kinds of inner mental processes that are not easily observable to the eye. And so cognitive psychologists often compare the mind to a computer and try to understand how information is processed and stored and remembered by the brain. Here's a simple diagram uh, explaining uh, the, the basic pathway of cognition. Uh, so as we learned in sensation and perception, uh, we receive sensory information through our eyes or through our ears, through our nose or through other sensory modalities. And that sensory information gets filtered through our emotions, through our memories, through our experiences. Uh, and then after that filtration, uh, we experience thoughts. Uh, so uh, very similar to what you learned in lab about top-down processing, uh, much of our thoughts uh, are, are influenced by prior experiences or by memories or by even emotions. 
So the brain uh, categorizes information uh, there's in many different ways, and there's many different ways of thinking about or, or terms that we use to uh, describe how uh, the brain uh, collects and categorizes information. Uh, one common term that we use is just the basic term of concepts, that a concept uh, can be an, an abstract thing or a concrete thing. Uh, something abstract would be like the idea of justice or something concrete would be uh, the various types of birds or uh, the, the various types of computers or something that is a physical object or something that's easily visible to the eye. We also often use the term hypothetical construct or sometimes we just say construct for short. Uh, which is an explanatory variable which is not directly observable. So for example, uh, intelligence is a construct. Um, there's many ways of measuring intelligence, such as using uh, intelligence tests, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Uh, but intelligence itself is a construct. It's an idea. It's influenced by what society thinks intelligence is. It's influenced by how a test will measure intelligence. There's no uh, way of visibly actually determining and seeing uh, what intelligence is. We only have proxies uh, of intelligence. Uh, another thing to discuss is prototypes. Uh, a prototype is the best example or representation of a concept. Uh, so for example, a lot of people talk about Gandhi as, uh, uh, as a prototype uh, for, civ for a, a civil disobedience or for someone who engaged in, in peaceful protest. And prototypes are useful when it comes to problem solving. It gives us examples and, and guidelines to go by. Uh, but prototypes can also be problematic when we use them to simplify complex arguments. And this is the example from the textbook, and I'm going to use it to apply it to a situation going on right now. Uh, so uh, uh, one common phrase that's being said right now is that, see, uh, uh, with, with unrest in the world, whether it be regarding the pandemic or uh, injustice going on in the world, that uh, there's a need for peaceful protest, not recognizing, and then people quote uh, people like Martin Luther King or Gandhi as prototypes of peaceful protesting, not realizing that uh, th there's a more complex argument underlying uh, peaceful protesting. Uh, protesting that was nonviolent or peaceful uh, uh, was not always well regarded by people in those in the eras of these prototypical um, uh, individuals, uh, and also it was often. Uh, the response to peaceful protests that really garnered uh, social change and, and change in legislation. So for example, people who protested peacefully uh, alongside Gandhi and, and uh, Martin Luther King were often beaten, were often uh, attacked by dogs, were often firebombed, were often had death threats. And it was those acts of violence against peaceful protests uh, that often uh, uh, woke up uh, moderates and uh, politicians to enact social change. Another example of, of the way that uh, uh, the brain organizes information is schemas. Uh, so a uh, schema is a construct consisting of a collection of related concepts. And they often make us uh, to behave in kind of automatic ways. So for example, a role schema is when you make an assumption about how a person will behave uh, in a certain role or because of their job or because of the role that they play, uh, that you think that, oh, their personality or their behavior is going to be uh, this way. So for example, uh, when you think about a librarian, uh, the stereotypical librarian, if someone tells you, oh, I, I work in the library, I'm a librarian, you might assume that they're a quiet person, uh, that they're very soft-spoken, that they're uh, maybe bookish and, and very much into, into you know, abstract novels. Uh, you know, you might picture a middle-aged woman like in this picture, but that's likely an overgeneralization. Uh, then there's event schemas, which are also called cognitive scripts, which is a set of routine or automatic behaviors. So for example, uh, when you enter an elevator, we automatically stand facing the door. It's very weird for someone to go into the elevator and face backwards. We'll talk about that more in the social psychology chapter. Um, and uh, event schemas can vary uh, greatly from uh, cultures uh, and countries. Another example of event schema is answering your phone. Uh, when you receive a text message, you might do that uh, automatically, even in a situation when it's dangerous to answer your phone, uh, like when you're driving a car. So some problem solving strategies, some ways that the brain uh, takes uh, concepts or schemas and tries to make sense of them to solve problems. Uh, there's many different problem solving strategies. I'm just going to discuss two, uh, two uh, opposing problem solving strategies. One is trial and error. Very, very simple. 
continuing to try different solutions until the problem is solved. So that's the kind of uh, problem solving strategy that we often use in Sudoku. Uh, then there's heuristics. A heuristic is a problem solving framework. So it's not as simple as just plugging in numbers or trying one thing after the other. It's relying on a rule of thumb. It's, it's saying, okay, this is how I solve problems. This is the best strategy to use problems and I'm gonna apply it to this situation and see if it works. Uh, so for example, um, uh, when it comes to politics, we see heuristics in politics a lot. Uh, some people might say, you know what? Uh, you know, when you get to an, el an election and there are you know, 100 names on the list, you are only thinking of the presidential candidate or maybe the uh, who is running for governor, uh, but there's 100 other names that you need to vote for. So one heuristic that people use is, well, I'm just gonna vote for you know, the political party that I support. I'm not gonna question uh, the stances of these individuals. I'm just going to vote Democrat or vote Republican uh, all the way down the line. Uh, uh, so that's one example of a heuristic that people make. I'm just gonna stick uh, to one piece of information without considering other pieces of information. Uh, so we often use heuristics when we're faced with a lot of information, when there's limited time to make a decision, uh, when there's uh, very limited access to more information for making a decision, or perhaps when we're emotional. Some pitfalls to problem solving uh, or using heuristics. Uh, one is a mental set. Uh, so that's the tendency to approach situations in a certain way because that method worked in the past. So for example, you check your engine light uh, uh, because uh, it comes on in your car. And so you decide to put more uh, oil in the engine and the check engine light uh, turns off. A few months later, the, the light comes back on again uh, and you put more oil in the engine, but this time it doesn't turn off. Uh, so you take it to the mechanic and they uh, tell you that uh, there's actually a spark plug uh, that's gone bad. Uh, so this is an example of, of a mental set. Uh, because pouring oil uh, worked in the past to fix this problem, when that problem arises again, I use the same problem solving strategy. And that's limited because there's so many things that could cause uh, a check engine light to come on in a car. Another example of a pitfall in problem solving uh, is functional fixedness, the inability to perceive an object that uh, to be used for something other than what it was designed for. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, this is a famous example. Uh, you're given a candle, a box of thumbtacks, and some matches. And your job is to mount the candle on the wall and light it. What would you do? Well, if you're like most people, you might think about maybe putting the candle um, horizontally along the wall and seeing if the thumbtacks can go through and try to pin it into the wall or maybe just using a few thumbtacks and find if it can stick out of the wall in a perpendicular fashion and then try to use the matches to light it. Um, but mo what most people don't realize is that you were actually given four items, uh, a candle, a box, uh, thumbtacks, and the matches, that the box can be used separately uh, from the thumbtacks. And in fact, you can even say you're given five items if you include uh, the, the, the little box that the matches come in. Uh, not helpful for solving the problem though. Uh, so the box, uh, you can use the thumbtacks to attach the box to the wall and then put the candle in there and then light it. So that's an example of not realizing that this box is not just for uh, carrying uh, uh, thumbtacks. It can also be used to help you solve the problem. You have to expand your mindset. Uh, we see this all the time. Another example could be uh, using uh, your phone uh, as, a, as a mirror. Your phone was not designed uh, for it to uh, function as a mirror, uh, but you can use it that way if you use the camera or just the, the reflection of the screen. Uh, so expanding your uh, perspective on what certain objects can be used for. In our next video, we're going to discuss cognitive biases.